course on Thursday. Maine just one of the places feeling that early taste of winter, even though meteorological winter is still a couple of days away. Officially starts on what, the 1st of December. But a couple of indicators that we look at, of course, to paint a winter outlook this year. It's the big question that a lot of folks are asking is, all right, starting to feel kind of chilly. So what's this year have in store for us, right? Well, we actually have to turn our attention into the equatorial regions of the Pacific Ocean. And we look at the water temperatures out this way. The blue that you're seeing indicates that we're expecting to see below average water temperatures. What's that mean? Well, that means a La Nina pattern is setting up. And of course, for our La Nina winter season, that pattern perhaps meaning that we will see influences back in the United States. Here's what that does. Note where the location of our Pacific jet stream is right here. Typically, when we have a La Nina pattern, that jet stream fluctuates, but it fluctuates a little further toward the north and kind of pushes some of that energy and that moisture up toward the north. It's one of the reasons why typically in a La Nina winter, the Pacific Northwest is a little bit more wet again, because of the positioning of that uh, Pacific jet stream. Stephen, interestingly enough, and as you know, typically with the moisture pushed up toward the north, it means yeah. it's a little bit drier down toward the southwest, but also a little bit warmer. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's always unique when you try to analyze how the winter is going to shape up because that's really the big climate driver, right? right? You've got El Nino, but then you do have these other facets. And, and when, you, when you look at other oscillations, which in weather school was one of the most fascinating courses that yeah. I covered, I debated going into grad school and looking oh, at interesting. Stony Brook uh, University actually mm -hmm. has a great, a great school with, with this type of research. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's in fact, arguably more significant when we look at the other oscillations, right? The Arctic oscillation yes. and how that's going to affect in the near term. But this actually gives us a, I guess, a more broad idea of what could possibly happen. Absolutely. And of course, you know, I, it's a term that gets sensationalized a lot, polar vortex. Yeah. Um, I forgot what year this was specifically, but I remember it was like a year and everyone was talking yeah, about yeah. the polar vortex, yeah, right? Yeah. I was still in college, I think. I think it was like... It was, like it was in like eight, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe around there. Either way, we had a huge outbreak. And so now it is something that we focus in on. A lot of folks have heard about the polar vortex. Yep. And, you know, basically what this means is if you get a weaker polar vortex, then it allows that jet stream that we were talking about to fluctuate a little bit more. Yep. That fluctuation actually allows for more what we call Arctic intrusions into places like the Midwest, perhaps even uh, parts of the mid-Atlantic, if depending on how this oscillation fluctuates, Stephen. Right. And so I think that for that reason, we'll have to watch to see what happens with our polar vortex and the strength and integrity of that polar vortex. It's essentially this idea that if, if that remains strong through the Arctic, you won't get the cold air to spill south. We are seeing evidence of that with this weekend cold snap that we're going to feel. Uh, I mean, it's not the real cold, but it's certainly cold that's beginning to build in the Arctic Circle. I mean, we've just begun what's called polar night mm -hmm. north of the Arctic Circle, where no sunlight will be seen until next year. So you, you do get naturally that real big cold cooling process mm -hmm. that occurs. And then you look into the actual months of winter, December and January and February, can that Arctic air spills south, only if we see that polar mm. vortex relax or ease just a bit. Yeah, and you know, that's exactly what we saw. So I was trying to look back at the dates here, Stephen, when we saw other uh, polar vortex years. Yeah. I think the one that I most remember, the one in college, of course, was uh, 2005, but I also remember the 2012 um, polar vortex year. Yeah, that one was uh, uh, that was pretty intense for the Midwest. Uh, the 2021 one, more recently, that actually New York City. I remember we got in on a huge cold. Snap. That's right. We did not have mm -hmm. big nor'easters, um, but there was that those two nights. I think it was in January where mm -hmm. temperatures dropped to zero and in below zero New York City in the city. Yeah, and it was extreme. But 
It's not extreme when there's no snow, if you ask me. You gotta have that snow. Yeah, I was gonna say, if it's, look, at my, I'm kind of with you on that. If it's gonna be cold, then please, like, yeah. I want the floodgates of snow to open up at that point. And that's what's so tough about this whole overall pattern. You can track the cold, but that just speaks to temperatures. Mm -hmm. Or you can track what typically provides a, a stormier pattern, the subtropical jet or any sort of polar jet that would bring these storms. Right. But that, those are separate oscillations. So it all works together. It's a chaotic system, mm -hmm. um, but it's fun to talk about it. Yes, it is.